Conrad, what else we got today? All right. We are, as always, starting. We, by the way, everybody, this is a Google free podcast. We're not going to talk about Google at all, other than talk about not talking about them. Well, so we are we're, going to. You're wrong. We are going to. Oh, crap. <laughs> but it's not going to be Google. This is no an Google SEO news. question. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We might have to have. I was excited to not talk about Google today. How can you talk marketing without talking about Google? I mean, I know. you know, we try not to. Well, and, you know, for audience people who are listening while we're having and hawing, we don't want to talk about Google all the time. But, you know, let's face it, people use Google to find lawyers. So, despite what many people think. All right. So, we, <laughs> after we do the news, we're going to not talk about Google first in our segment How much marketing do I need to know? However, we're then going to transition to a Google-heavy conversation around how do you market two practice areas from an SEO perspective on the same website? Hit it! And welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice here on Legal Talk Network. All right, everyone, welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Let's hit the news. All right, that newsreel does bring me back to my small town July 4th radio flyer parade days. I, I do like that. All right. Happy July 4th, everyone, when it arrives. Please find yourself in a small town watching a small parade because it is as America as you can possibly get. Okay. In the news, other than the date of July 4th, Hona, our friends at Hona <clears throat> have recently raised a, done a $9.5 million venture capital raise. Um, and I had a recent conversation with, with, with their founder, Matt McClellan, um, and one of the things I asked him, Guy, was why would you go in as kind of the second business in a market? And 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 really, what I is was, Hona? Was, what is Hona? <clears throat> great, great question. Thank you for redirecting my listeners. Hona does updates for a case. So you guys are probably familiar with case status and uh, our good friends at Hona. Uh, believe they built a better mousetrap. And I, I initially heard about Hona through our mastermind group when, when a couple of my uh, attendees to that mastermind group were, were talking about how great it is. You know, I did ask Matt, and now with this interest in this very, very large raise, um, why they were willing to go in and be number two in a market because case status has really done a great job for a long, long time. And he said, we've kind of built a better mousetrap because we listened to the complaints that we heard about keeping people informed and they have a an app free way to communicate between law firm and client and i think that is a key differentiator and why a lot of at least my clients really really love this tool sorry that sounded like as pitchy as you could possibly get but you open the door gee and i'll walk through it more news if you do not get enough gee and conrad in your life we will be speaking at the Answering Legal Summer Camps July 24th and August 14th. So if you want to hear more Guy and Conrad, please join us. For... Not just Guy and Conrad. There's a lot of... I, I don't, they, this is not, I don't know if this is their... It's the second time I think I participated, but great content. They, great, they have a lot of fun. I really enjoy uh, the Answering Legal Summer Jams. And it's called Summer Jam. That makes no, me feel... I made that up. Okay. That was they they summer call it camp. summer summer camp, right? I think that's right. Okay, but I like jam. We will put a link to the rebranding. If sorry, you answering here. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, we we will put that in uh in the notes. Uh, I can tell you some of the content that's going to be uh, talked about because they asked us to speak on these things. Marketing agency heads explain why your campaigns aren't working. What to know about search marketing twenty twenty four how to break through on social media, and how to elevate your firm's content creation, which should be interesting, as Guy and I often talk about not publishing more content for the sake of publishing 
more content. All right. So get more of Guy and Connor July 24th and August 14th. And next in the news items, we have a I told you so from Guy. Guy, do you want to uh, read this quote or shall I? And then you can gloat. You read it. You read okay. it. You set it up. I'm just going to so, bask in my glory. Bask in your I told you so. So uh, one of the, those of you who have listened, I think this was two episodes ago. We did a long conversation about... Actually, we did it two times in a row. We did a review of two elements of local service ads that I personally hate. One was the multiple messaging. So message multiple which meant that the lead went to multiple law firms. And the other was the inclusion of your branded terms in the keyword set for local service ads. And we kind of put your your approach into three buckets. You could either do nothing, um, turn off messaging, or opt out of the branded. And the problem being that there was no uh, transparency into the data of what you're actually bidding on. That's the, the end result of the problem. So we have at least one anecdote. I'll read this to you. This is from me uh, the other day. For those of you listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, listening to me and Gee talk about turning off brand queries in local service ads because you don't know how much they cost you and therefore pervert the economics of those campaigns. Gee has been warning for a while now that doing so might cause you to drop out of LSAs altogether. And I've cited examples of clients for whom that hasn't happened. Well, here's a counterpoint from a client who turned off the brand campaigns last month. His impression share dropped from a consistent 15% to one impression for the month. And so, uh, Guy, you can gloat. And you talked about watching impression share. And I, I didn't really think that was all that important. But boy, oh boy, was that a metric that was useful to watch. And you were right, man. Well, you know, again, this is anecdotes. And I'm not gloating here because I, for just as frustrated as everybody else is about the lack of transparency on this. But, you know, look. We talk about this all the time. It, where your economics make sense to align with Google, align them. Because it's the same thing with clicks. Google gets paid for clicks. If you, you know, again, you got you have to do all the go listen to the prior episodes. Don't just say, well, you said bid on broad match for everything because you gotta just get more clicks. But click through rate matters. And the you know, the best guess corollary here is is that uh, leads per impression, booked leads per impression, that's when Google gets paid. And so the more you're doing that, the, the more you're improving that impressions to leads rate, it sh holds to me that it'd be obvious that Google is going to show your ads more because Google's getting paid more times they show your ads. So, and again, to Conrad's point, I'm sure there are example counterpoints and all this stuff. And, and, and I know, and I know there's a lot of sentiment around, especially around mes messaging, that these messaging ads are, there's no intent and, you know, people don't, people using messaging don't sign up. You're totally wrong. I mean, well, I can't say that. Maybe it's right for you. But go look at how fast you're responding to the messaging before you conclude that everybody uses the messaging um, is not a client. And I'll think you're, if you're not responding like it's a text message, you're not 12 seconds from a cold text message. It's the, the, the issue is not just the messaging function of the of the tool. It's not the, necessarily a function of the intent of the user. It's because you're not answering them fast enough. And so I always challenge folks, and I'm like, you know, go look, go look at your average response time. If it's not seconds. It's it's not just because people on messaging don't have cases. And Guy is specifically speaking to someone who contacted him about this issue. I, I can tell that there's a story behind this on the on the messaging. Well, I there's, be... been a, there's been a couple. There's been a sure. couple times where people are like, you know, it's come up where people are like, the messages don't messaging doesn't work. And I'm like, uh, uh, you know, that, that's like being like live chat doesn't work. Right? Or phones don't work. Um, well, I, they're going to say phones work, but you know, phones, you got them on the phone. Phones, get, best thing since sliced bread. People don't, not everybody wants to be on the phone. But I want to be crystal clear to our listener, just because Guy and Connor have cited one data point where this is problematic doesn't mean that totally. it is universally, that that is right. a representation. I, if you are, if you are thinking about, if you are uncritically listening to lunch hour legal marketing, thinking that we should change our strategy because of this one anecdote, stop yourself right now and find it in your marketing strategy to test and validate what we've shown as a single data point against how you are actually performing and be ready to test this over and over again in a very blunt fashion with LSAs because there is no depth of data for you to analyze. And so you have and to lawyers, instrument this month to month. If you're the business owner, go to your marketing people and ask them to show you how fast they're responding to messages. <laughs> go ask. They're, but Guy, they're, we don't. We don't know. We respond to everything in real time. 
We do a great job. Great. Pete. Show me. Show me. We respond to everything in real time. Hey there, Lunch Hour Legal Marketing YouTube fan. Just land on this conversation. Please like and subscribe. And if you don't think that Conrad and Guy know what they're talking about with messaging and LSAs, please feel free to leave a comment and check out our conversation about LSAs and turning messaging off and brand on and off. There's all sorts of good stuff in that episode. So Conrad, you may remember a conversation we had during lunch hour legal marketing office hours that we hold on Fridays um, about a question, how much marketing do I need to know? And I'm going to read the question. Can anyone recommend a crash course in SEO slash marketing? I'm currently paying fine law $2,100 $2,100 per month. I interviewed another company who said I'm getting virtually no traffic to my website and that they can fix it for about $5,000 per month. I reached out to Fine Law who says my website is performing well. So Conrad, let's expand and give the people some more insight into the answer to this question. Okay. Th- there are so many layers to this. I, I nearly rudely interrupted you. Um, at the end of the first sentence, I'm currently paying fine law or halfway through the second sentence, I'm currently paying fine law. If you're currently paying fine law, you need to know more about marketing <laughs> because that's just a bad idea. Um, you know, I, I was going to take for this episode, this segment, I thought maybe we would zoom out a second. And I think you made, made a note here, but what role, you know, how much marketing you need to know depends on what role you are in your law firm, Right. Are, are you a solo that's trying to vet vendors? Are you the lead rainmaker? Are you just want to be a lawyer? Because that should answer the question of how much marketing you need to know. Fair. Let's let's assume that this is the leader of a growing law firm, which is the only reason you should be listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing in the first place, right? Who so, Maybe so they're not need, a growing need... law firm, but they have ambition to be a, an aggressively growing law firm. And are they at a stage where like they have the resources to hire a in-house marketing person? Well, the interesting thing... Oh, so... Okay, so... I- interesting question. They're paying $2,100 a month. They don't have the resources to hire an in-house marketing person. You don't. I don't know well, what you don't else know that. they're doing. You don't, from- you don't know. Yeah, we don't know that. That just might be undercapitalized <laughs> SEO? agency. Yeah, SEO, okay. right? Um, anyway, so so let's answer it both ways. So if you, I, I'm making so, the assumption that they're, they're saying a crash in, in SEO marketing, I'm currently paying fine law twenty one hundred dollars a month. That feels like the totality of their marketing budget. So I, it's not. Um, okay. I can tell you that this firm they were they do a lot of the uh, what they would describe it as referral based marketing. So they they do events, they do a lot of local stuff, and and that's what their in house person did. So. You know, they, so I'll just tell you the answer in this context is there is an in-house marketing person. They don't okay. know anything about SEO. They don't know anything about digital. And so, you know, so that's why back to the top, like how much should the lawyer? So if you don't have, if you don't have any, if you're the only person that's responsible for growth at your law firm, then you probably need to know a bit more, like you're, the level that you need to know, because guess what? You're either doing it yourself or you're outsourcing it. And so if you're doing it yourself, you need to know a lot. And if you're outsourcing it, you need maybe you need to know slightly less, but you need to know at least how to vet your partner. And so that's why I was going down this path of which if you don't, if you're looking to hire somebody, you need to know enough to be able to make a good hire. And so anyway, okay. the amount of marketing you need to know is very dependent upon, you know, what phase you're in and what role you're playing in your firm. So I would say that you just described two different people. You talked about the tax. They have an in-house person. They currently, so I'm asking that you know who this is. They currently have have, a a tactical local in-house person doing events. They have an in-house person who doesn't know digital very well. That's fine. By the way, that they, so I want to be clear. This is a digital marketing show. The (laughs) in-house person who knows the local market marketing really well. The in-house person who can do events, the in-house person who can grow referral relationships, that that person doesn't need to know four-fifths of anything about Google AdWords. They don't need to know well, again, what they, LSA they, but they stands need to, for. If, well, not necessarily, because if they're the person who's ultimately accountable yeah, for growth, I, yeah, yeah, they, they're is, the person that needs to know enough about vetting the partner. 
No, no, no. So or, what I'm or saying is hiring another digital person. The local person, the local outreach person. If I'm just saying jo- this, there's only one marketing person. There's one marketing person at the firm. Okay, but a lot, the, of, firms, a lot is, of firms look like I got one director of marketing. They're responsible for okay. marketing. No, no, I, I get that. Okay. Well, let me answer. Okay. If you have one person who is responsible for tactic, I think you, you, we need to separate tactics, tactical level execution from annual planning level strategy. And well, not the necessarily. Annual... Go ahead. Sorry. But, well, here's, a, here's my problem with, with not separating those out. If you have a local on the ground, feed, boots on the ground person, they're not going to be steeped in paper. I'll use this as paper click and SEO are two examples. You can have someone, it's, the unicorn is the person who can do the local stuff and crush it in paper click and crush it in SEO. That that person Very is rare. a unicorn, and Very so rare. or you're hiring Guy, you know Guy, the the doppelganger of Guy who's been doing this for twenty years and wants like a side gig doing something like this, and you're dropping two hundred fifty grand for that person, right? That's I don't think that's the right answer. the The flip side of that is you are the owner or you are high level in charge of growing the firm. What do you need to know in order to work with vendors and partners? I think those are two very, very different profiles, very different um, pay scales, and very different skill sets. And 100%. But, and that, okay. that kind of goes to the root of the question, right? How much yep. marketing do you need to know? So yep. again, if you're... I, I think it's pretty easy to separate these things. You either need to know enough to hire somebody or to okay. vet a vendor, okay. or you gotta, you've got to become a unicorn. <laughs> then you need to be yeah, super yeah, yeah. deep if you're the one doing this. Yep, and so that that to me is about it. And oh, or if you are the owner of the firm, but you're not in the marketing function at all, you use EOS language, yeah. then maybe you need to know very little, right? Because you've got good people around you who know it. You've got a director of marketing, you know, you got a CMO, and you got tactical people. But you know, that's that's my whole point about this. And in, in this particular example, the answer is is for this particular firm was. You need to know enough to make a good hire. That's what the that's what the okay. real answer is. And so, how much okay. is that? So, so we're gonna. I want to go. So we we went up, and now I want to get down into the weeds of this specific situation. And you said something early on that I want to come back to, <clears throat> but but implicit in here is your incumbent saying things are going well, and your 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 vendor pitching you the new vendor pitching you that's telling you that everything is a disaster. You said specifically that the vendor, the new vendor, was showing them that they're getting no traffic to the website. And then you said something else. I want to clarify. Why does the new vendor, why does the pitcher think they're getting no traffic, Guy? Because they're trying to pitch them on SEO services? I mean, No, no, using, no. But, but how are they evaluating yeah. that? Assessment, right? They're Presumably, using, they're using yeah, okay. a third party tool like SEMrush. Okay, SM. that's what I was trying SEMrush? to lead you to. Do you say SEMrush or SEMrush? This is like I, one of those jiffy, jiffy I, things. I, I don't care. I, I think I, it's supposed to be SEMrush. I say SEMrush, but I, yeah, yeah they, these are things that like I'm, I'm not going right. to worry about. I say SEMrush. So okay, but but because we keep saying SEMrush, let me delve into this and the vendor problem with this. So let me be crystal clear on this. SEMrush or SEMrush is a third-party tool that tries to evaluate a lot of things on your site from the outside. Consistently, they estimate traffic massively low and inaccurately. And if you look yeah, massively, at the I would say massively inaccurately and even more massively inaccurately when you have a small site without when you, you have know, the lower, the, the lower your sample size. So, th- right. but, but, but this is, this is the key. And this is where I think a level of cynicism needs to come in to play on both sides, the incumbent and the third party. If you have a third party who is citing SEM rush data to tell you that you're not getting a lot of traffic. One of two things has to be true. Either that firm is so unbelievably unsophisticated that they think that data is accurate, in which case you shouldn't hire them, or 
They are deliberately using data that they know to be grossly miscalculated to try and pull the wool over your eyes. And I would never engage with a firm who uses SEMrush data to tell you from the outside how your website traffic is doing. That is disingenuous. You, you are either stupid or lying. <laughs> But Conrad, that's the only data we have. We don't have access to analytics. That's the only data we have. Counsel. So, th- so yeah. exactly. So th- this might be what a what. And then, by the way, there's lots of stuff that we can look at from the outside to look at the health of a site from an SEO perspective. And SEM Rush is not one of those things because it is at best grossly misleading and inaccurate. And so, if you're standing by that data and you know it is a house of cards, like. That that is a that is a terrible untrustworthy vendor. I hate to I hate to say that. If you want to talk data, go talk from the same data point. Now I've got another problem with fine law, right? I've got I have another problem with your vendor telling you that everything is hunky dory because what they want every vendor wants to show you up and to the right because they think that's what you want to see and it's an easy MBA graph to draw that makes everyone feel like everything is going very very well. So I don't necessarily think that the incumbent data, especially if you're relying on them to report on how you're performing, I don't think that's a good idea either. And you've heard Guy and I talk, sorry, you got me totally worked up on this. I just, I can't perfect. stand these vendors who, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, my, um, one more thing that I wanted to add, because again, getting back to how much marketing I need to know, and if you, you know, maybe this is the goosh. Did we say goosh? Did the we goosh! Say that? The goosh. We, say the goosh. we were talking about the goosh on the show before. I think so. Um, but I don't think anyone will know what we're talking about. But, but hit yeah. the goosh. The, the goosh is, is that the answer to the question is you need to know enough that you're able to hold whoever is responsible for marketing accountable for delivering on an objective. And so in this context, is the answer is you need to know enough to say, hey, am I con- am I opening cases? from organic search. And you know, if you can't if you don't know how to figure out if that's true or not, that's then right. you need to learn more. Because otherwise you're going to be susceptible to both of these issues. You're going to be susceptible to I don't have, you know, my vendors telling me I've got 20 million visits a month and my the person trying to win my business telling me I have zero. And it's, it's just funny cuz like this particular example is such an egregious case of that. But once you can say I know that I'm opening X number of cases from organic search a month, and this is my goal of trying to uh, open this number of cases from organic search. Then, you know, to me, visitors becomes less of a thing. So, yeah, I, I'm with you, Conrad, that there's maybe a trust issue because they are misleading you. But ultimately, when when you when push comes to shove, it's about are you able to connect open cases um, to the channel that you're paying for, in this case, SEO, and and vice versa, when this the potential prospect of agency, um, I'd be like, you know, I don't really care about this SEM rush stuff. Can you show me how how many cases am I going to get from your activities over time? And if, I want to be. And that's his. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that. That's how, that's the to me. That's the answer to the question. You have to know enough to be able to hold your marketing people accountable for delivering the business objective. And at, my... very, at the very floor. Of this example. My tangent on this is you cannot rely on your vendor to tell you how well your vendor is doing. You cannot tell them, have them tell you how many customers they're delivering for you. You want to have the conversation with them on the same side of the table about that. But like we've talked about, go back to some of the pay-per-click episodes where vendors are taking credit for branded queries, for, for, for clients who show up as branded um, queries and they have nothing to do with that, right? And right. so you 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 need to be in control of knowing where the data is coming from instead of trusting what people like Guy and Conrad send you. Because people like Guy and Conrad, maybe not us specifically, are incented to pull the wool over your eyes. There, we've maligned the industry again. Check. Well, we'd like to take this minute to thank a recent reviewer of Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Harrison A. Lord writes, my favorite legal podcast Nice. Engaging and entertaining content. I learned something new every episode. And we are so grateful. Uh, that's what we do it for, is to hear that feedback. And, you know, we regularly beg everybody to leave reviews. So thank you, Harrison A. Lord. And 
Uh, to anybody else that is enjoying this, please do leave a review on Apple or Spotify and subscribe and comment or review us. I guess you could review us in a comment on YouTube. And we're both of us are pretty active on LinkedIn. So if you're not connected on LinkedIn and you listen to the podcast, feel free to connect. We promise we won't DM pitch you. At least I won't. I don't know about Conrad. Well, we Find automate it. LinkedIn. You know, <laughs> you're out. Hey, great. Are you being taken advantage of by your marketing? How to triple your cases in three simple steps. We won't do that. Yes. Either, promise. All right. All right. Thank you. And now we have a great question from our friend Ben Glass, who clearly does not show up for our live sessions because we did answer this somewhat in the live session recently. But Ben Glass writes, hey... We have two pretty distinct practice areas and one website. One practice area is about 66% of revenue and the other is about 33% or so. In terms of web content, including blogs and case results, should the allocation of content be along those same percentages or does that matter to Google? In other words, we don't necessarily want to overpower what Google thinks of our lesser lesser meaning smaller here, really. I'm ad-libbing here, but, but I don't want to use the word lesser. I'm going to say smaller practice area and diminish the practice area that brings more cases. Thanks. And since I can complicate anything, one practice area is statewide, the larger one, while the other allows us to handle cases all over the country. Guy, as one of my favorite SEOs, what should Mr. Glass think about when he's trying to answer this question? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to take it outside of SEO for a second. Oh! Because it's not clear to me where Ben wants to go. He's saying we got one practice area that's currently 60%, 66% of revenue, and the other is 33%. Is that what you want? What share of voice are you commanding for each of those practice areas? Are you trying to change that? Or are you just saying we, you know, we're we're basically like we're t- we're taking it as a given that it's 66 and 33? Because that's the real because but all this is, I mean, there, there's a Google. SEO part of this that we'll get to. Okay. But the, to me, it starts with the re what is your, you got an overall resource allocation that you're going to devote to each of these practice areas. That should be dependent upon whether you're trying to, you know, are you trying to grow the 33% past the 66% or are you taking that as status quo and what are the value of these different cases? So anyway, that's maybe an asterisk that wasn't implied in this, but I, I, so many, a lot of firms, not saying Ben's doing this, but a lot of firms, they'll just say, you know, we're 75% one thing and 25% the other thing. And I'm like, is that by design or is that just you stumbled into it? That's just the status quo. Um, Cause that will impact your resource. Are you trying to make the 25% your 75%? In fact, the um, the conversation we had in the office hours that you alluded to about this, that was the essential question. I, that, that firm was a uh, PI in business. And, you know, we started going down the rabbit hole of like, well, PI, 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 and he's like, well, he's like, actually, my uh, business uh, practice makes up more of my revenue, but I'd like to grow PI yeah. to be a bigger chunk, right? So that impacts your decision about resource allocation. Anyway. Okay. Um, so but in terms of like the, the SEO thing, like, yeah, sure. it, any anytime you try to cover more, you're going to have a challenge in terms of uh, Google's eyes. And, and the biggest one, this was the same conversation we had in the other context, is in local. Local, okay. you get one primary category. But there's a lot of other there's a lot of other aspects of this, and I'll, I don't want to dominate this SEO thing. So, Conrad, what do you think about multiple practice areas in SEO? Well, I want to I want to hit one point that we'll hit it quickly and move forward. But it, it's implicit in the beginning of the question. You're going to say stop pretty- doing blogs. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to say keep doing what works. Ah, um, but but he asked in, in, in the question, we have two distinct practice areas and one website. Let me just shoot dead the idea that you should have two different websites. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is also at the risk of harping on blogs, I wouldn't have multiple blogs for these different things. Right. So the SEO theory suggests that the hardest thing, you've heard this from me and Guy ad nauseum forever, so just kind of rinse and recycle. The hardest thing to do is build up authority for a site. And in 
these practice areas, I know what Ben does, it's competitive and legal. Everything is competitive. And so when you market two different websites, you are now splitting the hardest thing to do and diluting what you're doing. There is a reason that the directories don't have 27 or 270 different websites. They have one, and it is because of the authority. And that's the way to win the game. So throw that idea out the window if that's what you were thinking about. But when you do start diluting your content, your focus, it becomes difficult. And I'll use an extreme example of this, but I have seen this over and over again. We have seen hacked websites that have law firm content on it and porn on it. And if you're a stupid computer, it's very, very difficult to understand what that site is about if 80% of the content is hidden to the user but but visible to a computer is porn and 20% of it is legal content. And you're like, what is this? I'm throwing it out. So don't think that that is not a concern. Um, so it is difficult. The way to overcome this, from an, and this is an SEO answer, the way to overcome this, and we've talked about this ad nauseum, is building up your site authority. And so I would want to, in answering this question, Ben, I would want to look at, and I would, I would have two ongoing filtered segments because you have two very different practice areas. I want to know which of those has the most potential for easy growth. I'm making the full, I'm, I'm ignoring Guy's initial recommendation specifically here, which is where do you want to grow? I'm going to try and answer the question of where is the biggest growth potential with the lowest cost? And so I would segment your traffic out. there. So there's one that's national and there's one that is local. And so you can add a filter to only look at people who are in a specific state, say Virginia in this example, and looking at content that represents that local practice area. And then I would look at everything else and look at the national traffic and look that, that is looking at those pages that have a national practice area. And, and those are two distinct components of marketing. And then I would look at the competitive set for those things. And the national stuff, it's really difficult, right? It can be really difficult because it is 50 times bigger than the average state, right? And so, but where is the biggest opportunity for growth? And I would put your efforts there. And I would look at who's winning, who is, which of those markets has the biggest opportunity to spend as little, to, to, to have the, the, the biggest growth for the amount that you put into it. And it's unlikely that the answer is they're both the same. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I think the other... <clears throat> issue that I have with how this is framed is, is that there's an assumption that quantity of anything corresponds to production. Okay. More, more web content, you know, so I got 66 and 33%. So 66% yeah. of my, po you know, if I got 100 posts, 66 of them should be on this practice area and 33 should be on this practice area. This is not how it works, right? Right. One piece of content can generate, you know, uh, a different amount of revenue Right. Um, based on a bunch of different factors. And so, you know, I, that's the other thing too, where I'm like, and, and I, I get the question is, is like, you know, look, we've only got so much time in the day. We're only doing so much, just to simplify things, we're only creating so much content a week. Okay. How should we think about divvying it up? And, you know, the there is no like linear answer to that. Um but but I do if you're gonna if you're gonna try yeah, I think the, the advice you gave is pretty good. But I, again I'm I'm like if, you, if in order for this for the answer to this question to make any kind of sense or to have any kind of framework for it, it, I think it should be thought of in terms of goals for the practice area from a case standpoint, and then the resource allocation that you think you need to deploy to hit that goal not as a function of the other practice areas. So, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you have some way to, to quantify the amount of resource allocation, maybe it's in hours, I don't know, maybe, or I guess you could do pieces of content, but figure out how many hours, money, pieces of content you need to hit the practice area goal and forget about 
you know, how it relates to as a percentage of current revenue. Like that, I wouldn't connect those. I wouldn't connect content quantity to revenue percentages like this. I think is my answer. On a so I guess, theoretical, so I guess the short yeah. answer is no, I should not. So, that, you know, I'm reading the, uh, the clip here in terms of web yep. content, including blogs and case results, should the allocation of content be along those lines? I would say no. I agree with that because that is a, 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 a meaningless correlation between volume of, I mean, Guy and I have talked about the problem with content and the volume of content for, in fact, we can put in the show notes, we did a whole episode on why a lot of people are telling you that you need to post more to never delete content from your website are completely wrong and should never be listened to from an SEO perspective. Right. Um, so we, we, I think he and I are on the same page that those two things, there should no, not be any linearity to that. I, I think from a pure philosophical perspective, you need to think about the, the, the correlation between a site's ability to rank for multiple things, multiple practice areas. And I'll use, again, I'm going to use this exam, these two extreme examples. The directories are successful in ranking for, for all of the practice areas in many cases because they outperform everyone else on authority. And that's why four to six of the results in the top 10 happen to be directories. And I think it's weird or and Forbes. stupid. And Google, or, oh, we have, I was going to promise to come back to Forbes. I'll have to whisper in your ear my research on Forbes in a little Ooh, bit. Can't wait. Next episode. Maybe office Next. hours topic. N maybe office hours. Oh, we could do that as a teaser. Show up to office hours and I'll spill on Forbes. Um, sorry. So, and, and actually Forbes is a great example of this where they're able to rank across practice areas because they have the authority to back it up. Right. And that's why the directories can do it. And on the other flip side of the extreme is you have a site that's been hacked with a bunch of content that is like completely irrelevant to the practice of law. And that is going, that's, that's why it hurts you. That's why it hurts getting hacked. Even if no one actually sees the content, you get crushed in SEO because Google doesn't know what you're about and they're not going to even bother indexing, let alone crawling a lot of your pages because it doesn't relate to what you do. You can have so much content, they're not even look at it, right? And so I think you need to think of, of the answer to that question across the spectrum, but use your own data to guide the answer. One more nuance on this. Go. And I, I'm reading, probably reading more into it just because, you know, we know Ben and we know his firm. The, the, the local practice the, and the, the, local, the people that are searching locally it's good. The content's going to be a lot, a lot less of the factor. It's going to be local SEO stuff versus yeah. na nationwide. You know, those queries are probably not generating map pack results. And so, you know, the content strategy, you know, it, so anyway, I, what I was getting at, and, I, and again, this is anecdotal. This is not any research. Ben, don't go do this. Don't listen to me. But um, my question would be looking at these practice areas and seeing you know, from an SEO perspective, are most of my cases coming through GBP tracked calls and GBP Great. clicked links versus the nationwide practice? Uh, and maybe it's more long tail research based queries, but it's not localized anyway. So that so guess what? That Great. drastically will impact your resource allocation on content. That is the best answer. The the even thinking about which channels you should play in changes based on on these nuances right and and you've heard Guy and i talk about it's not every channel not every firm should use every channel and this is this is a great answer to to that very very specific question thanks conrad and with that high compliment we must say thank you because we are out of time uh if you just stumbled across this episode of lunch hour legal marketing please do subscribe on your favorite podcast widgets and check us out on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn because we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review, give us feedback, suggest a show topic, show up for office hours and subscribe to the Byte newsletter. Until next time, Conrad and Guy saying farewell for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Money makes a, money makes a, it makes a world go round. Money makes a world go
Your money make a world go round. Your money make a world go round. Your money make a world go round.